First things first, we will be inviting uh, Viktor Danchev on stage. Viktor is uh, also known as Bulgarian Batman, uh, in the sense that um, he has two lives during the day. He is the CTO of uh, Endurosat, one of the sexiest Bulgarian uh, tech uh, startups that deals with space. Uh, Viktor is standing awkwardly next to me. Uh, so during the night, what he's doing is uh, Basically this, he's being a theoretical physicist during events uh, and uh, on podcasts and various shenanigans. So, ladies and gentlemen, Victor Dante. So, Victor, how awkward was this? Nice to see all of you. Very awkward, like usual. Thank you, thank you. I've been, I've been... Practicing. You've been practicing, yeah. I've been practicing for a long fucking time. Okay, so um, where should we start? I mean, uh, I think the most obvious thing when we're talking about some kind of apocalypse uh, is usually all the questions we get asked by the media. So what kind of meteor they're gonna, is going to wipe us out, etc., etc. The, the most pedestrian stuff. Right? The most pedestrian stuff. Okay. Um, so, first of all, do you guys know the difference between meteor, meteoroid, and asteroid? asteroid. I won't go into details anyway, but uh, Google it. It's it's cool stuff. These are different things. Google it. It's cool. Um, so depending really on the velocity with which stuff impacts us, it can vary in size. And uh, in the solar system, there's all kind of objects. So it's really difficult to predict what kind of thing might kill us, would kill us, because it could be something which is much smaller than we expect right now, which is moving extremely fast and which we cannot capture. Or it could, it could be something really big, like the one that kind of killed the dinosaurs, which we're really sure of uh, existed and, and hit us somewhere near Mexico. Uh, but this is, for me, it's kind of a pedestrian scenario. Mm. This kind of thing, as you said, because it's not the end of the world. I mean, even an asteroid impact, it really needs to be big or it really needs to be fast to really get us to the end of the world. In most cases, it's just going to give us a huge cataclysm, which, um, you know, in a few couple of hundred thousand years to a few million years is going to get back to at least the bacteria go growing back out and so just on and so forth. Just a huge cataclysm, yeah. A huge cataclysm. I mean, we survived through one. I mean, our, our ancestors survived through one. So it's not such a big deal. It's it's kind of boring because life survives. Civilization uh, doesn't survive, most likely. But with the current stage, you know, at least life survives. So this is, as you said, pedestrian for me. I'm more interested in uh, larger, more dramatic crises. So, so basically, you're interested in, like, planet destroyers. Planet destroyers, yeah, yeah. So what would you need to destroy the planet? This is a different topic. Now, if you want to do it with an asteroid, um, one such scenario is if it's an extrasolar asteroid. If you have those in the solar system, they're kind of, I would say, predictable. They're orbiting more or less uh, in a fixed way. They fluctuate, they go around here and there. They're, they can be dangerous, of course. They can be dangerous for all of our society. Mm. But uh, as I said, they're not so dangerous because... Uh, we're, I mean, society is going to collapse, people are probably going to be gone, but mm. let's face it, life keeps on. But what do you need to actually destroy the Earth is something which moves in excess of uh, what we would call orbital velocities of the solar system. So just to imagine how fast this should be, the Earth goes at about 30 kilometers per second. So just imagine 30 kilometers per second, um, you know, 30 kilometers is like a nearby village here in a second. And... Uh, asteroids yeah, that hit us, depending on where they come and how they hit us, even if they're just as big as a, basically as a small city, something like Sofia, uh, in the world uh, sizes, uh, 
of, with this velocity is not so bad. I mean, they're mm. they're gonna cause uh, mass explosion. They're gonna cause mm. um, nuclear winter for hundreds of years. But even maybe not all of the people are gonna die. Probably some of them are gonna be able to dig in, live in the you know deep subway. It's gonna be kind of like a nuclear winter. It's okay. But if we start increasing the velocity of this asteroid, now it really depends on how it hits us. Because if it comes from behind us, mm -hmm. it's actually good. Because we have velocity in one direction, and this thing hits us in the same direction. It's like if they hit you uh, with a mm. car in the mm. back, it's kind of better than hitting you in the front, right? Mm. So if it hits us from in the back, it can be quite decent, quite okay. But if it hits us frontally, the speed's up. Mm -hmm. so, and it depends on the angle. It really depends on the angle. And if it hits us really badly frontally, and if it's a really elliptical kind of asteroid coming from really outside of the of the inner planets, it can hit us not with 30 kilometers per second. It can hit us with 70, 80, 150 mm. kilometers per second. And the bad thing about velocity that you should know is that energy grows by its second power. So if something moves twice as fast, it's four times as crappy. If it moves 10 times as fast, it's 100 times more crappy in terms of energy is going to unleash. So if you go above a few hundred kilometers per second, which is already mm. something which is uh, a rock maybe formed in a different star system, um, things get really bad. I mean, literally, they can get bad enough to destroy every single living thing on the on the planet. So basically, and it needs to be extra solar. It needs to be extra solar to really make shit real, let's mm -hmm. say, like this. And it doesn't need, uh, it, it can't come from the ecliptic. It, 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 in most cases, it doesn't come from the ecliptic. And actually, we had an object like this coming mm -hmm. in the solar system, not hitting the Earth, obviously. But we had an object like this two years ago, which was kind of kind of weird. I don't know if you if you heard of it. It's Umuamua. This, Umuamua, Umuamua, something like this. It's this Hawaiian name for a distant traveler. And it came and sweeped really quickly. And many people were hoping it's going to be Rama, but it wasn't. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, something like this is really the dangerous part here. Now, the good news for you, and most of the stuff I'm going to talk about, um, un unlike my counterpart, is much more devastating, but much more unlikely. So I'd like to try and quantify it a little bit with uh, probability, and I'd mm. like to use something, not percentages. This percentages doesn't mean anything in this scale. It can happen in 10 years, can happen in 10 million years. It's, it's really hard to quantify. But I just want to give you kind of the chances idea. So an asteroid like this, an extrasolar asteroid hitting mm. us with enough velocity to kind of fully obliterate the Earth, the equivalent of that is a drunk person, a drunk person shooting in a random direction and hitting an object the size of a, you know, um, basically a cherry or something of the kind, a cherry, hitting an object the size of a cherry with an object which is the size of a pinhead uh, over about 3,000 kilometers. Hmm. So basically shooting randomly somewhere with a, with a pinhead in a straight direction and hitting a cherry 3,000 kilometers away. R mm -hmm. Roughly, this is the kind of scales that you can think about. That's so the most likely one. That, that's kind of the most likely one of everything we're going to talk about. I see everyone is super calm there. They don't give a... <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, yeah. I mean, disclaimer, everything we're talking about, it's very unlikely to happen in our lifetime. Yeah. But some of the stuff we're going to talk about is actually a hundred, almost a hundred percent likely. So as far as we can tell, it's a hundred percent with our current understanding to happen in the future at some point. Mm. So what would be the less likely option for the for the Earth to be destroyed? So let's say it's not an asteroid from an outside uh, galaxy or something else. What's, what's going to be uh, a bit cooler for us to get destroyed by? For me, one of the cool things which people kind of don't think about much because it's a bit rarer is something called gamma ray bursts. I don't know if you've, you've heard about those guys. It's, um, so what, this is, this is for me something which is almost, almost as likely as the, as the asteroid scenario, a bit hmm. less likely, but kind of more brutal and more unpredictable. Because even an extrasolar asteroid, we're going to have some chance of detecting it, some chance of measuring this hmm. thing. Let's say that we're going to have a chance to, to send the ship out, not to intercept it, because with this kind of velocity, no chance, but at least to escape the Earth, I don't know, try to settle somewhere else, uh, on Mars or whatever. Um, but gamma ray burst is a bit more dangerous because as we as we go in the in the scenarios that that you because he's a he's a kind of a douche he wants to kill on a grander scale um, as we go through some of the scenarios that not we not only are, because of this I'm because, a douche in yeah, general I mean, right? we, we're doing podcasts I know, I know him quite well but as we go towards the other scenarios it becomes apparent that um, the more sure something is to happen in the long term the more devastating it is also on spatial scale so. 
while a rogue asteroid from another solar system is only going to destroy the Earth, uh, I mean, it, it cannot physically hit both the Earth and Mars, for example, then, then it becomes practically zero as a chance. So we, we still have some kind of escape, you know, go to mm. Mars, go to somewhere, whatever. But gamma ray bursts, on the other hand, um, it's these events which happen when super compact objects um, experience some turmoil. Let's say it like mm. this. So what I mean by super compact objects is basically black holes and neutron stars. So the, the, the universe's densest objects um, that we have. So when these objects are born, they're usually born in very violent explosions of huge stars. And this during these explosions, the energy which is released, and it's usually released in a very directed manner, so it's directed in certain um, it literally cones or directions mm. in which it shoots out because of the fields it has, this energy can exceed the full energy of a whole galaxy, so literally hundreds of billions of stars over a few days. So one single star exploding so violently that it pushes out more energy than a whole galaxy, than 100 billions of stars. Just to imagine, I mean, a human brain has about a few hundred billion uh, neurons. Mm. So, so if you're literally you're talking about a galaxy has uh, as many individual stars as you have cells in your brain, uh, I hope most, most of us, but um, I mean, can you imagine having one star exploding so violently that, that it reaches this? And in this process, stuff like black holes and neutron stars are formed. Sometimes they collide with each other and they can also mm. do this post, post factum. I mean, after the explosion mm. of the star, they can still do it. And um, kind of the good news is that this happens, uh, the, the really high energy gamma bursts, they happen in certain directions because of the mm. magnetic fields, because of the dynamics of this thing. It's spinning, it's forming specific magnetic fields. It shoots these jets in space in certain directions. So it's kind of good because it doesn't happen everywhere. So basically space lasers. Basically space death lasers, like kind of kind of space death star thing. But doesn't the energy dissipate uh, with, uh, yeah. with distance? Yeah, this is the reason why we don't die. I mean, if, if the energy didn't dissipate with the distance, uh, all of the gamma ray bursts we have observed would have killed us already. Um, luckily, we observe these in very remote areas. We observe mm. them usually in different galaxies because such a burst is very rare to happen. In, in, in a single galaxy, it's something that you don't see every day. You don't see every a few thousand years. Mm. You, don't, you generally see it quite rarely. And for this, again, to kill us, it needs to happen in a very particular direction. Mm. So kind of, again, we're talking about shooting overall, but I'm going to give you the, the comparison again. But it needs to be in a really in a near vicinity. It can be much further than I would say near a star system, because what I said a while ago, so shooting 3,000 kilometers away at Cherry, mm. this is if the asteroid comes from a nearby star system. It could be even lower chance if it comes from mm. further out. But with the gamma ray burst, uh, it can be within a few tens of light years or e even a few hundred light years, depending on how powerful it is, and still destroy us. But the bad thing there is that this laser beam, this uh, space death ray, mm. when it shoots out, it shoots out and diverges in space, so it loses energy. But if it hits, it's going to decimate the whole solar system, basically. Cool. So the bad thing there is that if... First of all, if we see something like this, it's traveling with the speed of light. There's no warning about it. So with the asteroid, we can conceivably know about it at least days or weeks or months, depending on how fast beforehand, and do something. I mean, maybe just panic and kill each other, but, but still do something. <laughs> with this, it's kind of instantaneous. I mean, bright light. So fun stuff. <laughs> but, uh, well, the good news is, first of all, that you would not feel it. I mean, it's literally kind of going to be a vaporization. Uh, the bad news is that <laughs> the bad news is that it can it can literally destroy uh, something on the scales of solar systems. Um, well, not destroy the actual stars in, in, per se, but basically vaporize and, and heat up to such a high extent, something like planet Earth, to make it into a, a worthless uh, rubble of rocks. What would happen if this hits the sun? If this hits the sun, it can actually influence its trajectory, it can influence its dynamics, but it would not destroy it. Because uh, the sun okay. is kind of, you know, kind of hot itself. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I mean, so what would be an even more outlandish idea about some kind of object fucking us up? I mean, would, no. would there be, for example, can we imagine a supermassive object entering the solar system, for example? Yeah. No. Uh, I'm going to tackle this in two parts. Uh, one part, which is kind of societal, but not uh, not about the collapse of society, but about, uh, let's say, unknown physics, unknown science, and stuff like this. And mm. one which is about um, astronomical stuff. Mm. So astronomically, the hard thing about knowing how likely or unlikely it is to have, a, for example, a black hole, 
is that we don't kind of we don't really see them much. I mean, especially the small ones, we don't see them much. We see the huge ones in the center of galaxies. Mm. We see those which are millions of solar masses. You saw some pictures of black holes uh, two weeks ago. If you're science geeks and fans, you know that two weeks ago we made a second picture of a, of a black hole with the Event Horizon mm. Telescope, and it was our own bee hole, our own uh, black hole in the center of the, our the Milky own Way. Our hole. Yeah, that, that, that's how that's how a lot of people announced it. But um, so yeah, it, it's like four million solar masses. So it, it weighs four times the mass of the mm. uh, four million times the mass of the Sun. And I'm just going to tell you that the Sun weighs about I mean, has a mass of about one million times the Earth. So you can, you can get kind of the scale, uh, mm. what, what kind of a thing we're talking about. It's 10 with 12 zeros, the mass of the, the Earth. And the Earth is pretty massive. So mm. I, I can go about with your mama's so fat jokes, but Jesus. It's, it won't be fun. Um, anyway, so um, the, the point is that these big ones, we see them. But if you have a, a black hole, which is one solar mass, which is kind of a collapsed small star, mm. you have almost no way to detect it. It's really difficult to detect these things. We can detect them nowadays from stuff like gravitational bursts. If mm. they are eating something else, they can do these gamma ray bursts and other cool stuff. Mm. So we can see them in some way. But if it's a it's a black hole which is by itself traveling, it's basically impossible to to see. I mean, you need something to orbit around it. You need it to eat something. You need to do uh, to have some kind of an effect. So. If something like this came in, and we don't really know the chance of this, so this is it. We assume, based on our current knowledge and kind of yearly experiences for the past five billion years, mm. that the Earth wasn't eaten by such an object, that it's pretty rare, mm. and we generally don't think it's going to happen to us. But if something like this were to enter the solar system, it doesn't necessarily mean death, and this is the this is the interesting part. But doesn't doesn't it rely on the trajectory again? I mean, it yeah, isn't... it's very important what the trajectory is going to be, but. Basically, what I can tell you is that a rogue black hole entering the, the solar system, it could be exactly the same effect as a rogue star entering the solar system. The only mm -hmm. difference is that we cannot see one of them, we can see the other. Mm -hmm. Because one thing that people misconcept about black holes is that they don't swallow any, everything. They mm -hmm. just swallow whatever goes beyond what's called mm -hmm. their horizon. So if you have a black hole with the mass of the sun, if you are far enough from it, if the sun became a black hole right now, we will still orbit it. We wouldn't mm -hmm. fall into it. It won't eat us. It's just if the sun be became fun. a black yeah. hole with the same mass, if the sun became one solar mass black hole, hmm. gravity we feel is going to be exactly the same, nothing different. The only crap is going to come if you get too close to the horizon, which for the sun, by the way, is three kilometers. So if you want to, around three kilometers. So if the sun collapses to a black hole, its radius, which is right now 700,000 kilometers, it needs to shrink to three kilometers. Hmm. And if you get within these three kilometers, you can never escape. But if you're far, if you remain where we are right now, we don't care. So basically, if a rogue black hole enters, mm. it's going to be kind of the same effect gravitationally as if a rogue star enters, as long as it's low mass. So it's going to influence the planets. If it's if it's like one solar mass or similar kind of mass, it, it would be like all of a sudden the sun has a, a twin star. They're going to start orbiting each other. Mm -hmm. Depending on the velocity it comes under, they might eat each other. And th then mm. this becomes kind of bad because we lose our sun. And not because of the gravity itself, but because of the, the light. But they might actually stably start orbiting each other. Mm -hmm. And then with these two bodies, everything else orbiting is going to be a, a hell of a crap. Because all of the cool, stable um, resonances and orbits and stability we have right now is going to become almost completely unpredictable. And you're going to get planets and asteroids slamming into each other. You're going to get stuff jumping up and down and mm -hmm. so on. Three-body problem, for those of you who've read the books and so on, it's kind of bad because with two bodies, give me two sheets of paper and I can write out the full solutions, everything possible. You add a third body, no way. Only with a computer you can begin to sample what can happen. So there's a bunch of other scenarios in this. So essentially, that depending on the trajectory of the black hole or whatever massive object, this could uh, bundle up the trajectories of the you know the orbits of uh, the different planets. Yep. So this means that this could potentially launch a planet outside of the solar yeah, system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically I would divide it in three different ways of dying in this scenario. Mm -hmm. One which is extremely unlikely is that the black hole directly hits us mm -hmm. or comes so close that we are within its event horizon and we get kind of swollen. And this is not going to be cool. It's not going to be nice. Uh, we're we're going to get through this process which people call spaghettification. So the thing about black holes, and you've, you've all seen probably interstellar and stuff like this, you know that the closer you are to a gravitational source, actually to the event horizon, 
the slower time moves, the way that I say it is completely wrong, but I, I won't say the, the formal way because it sounds weird. Um, but basically, if you have two observers, one is closer to the black hole, one is further. For the one closer, one minute is actually going to be more time for the one further. So kind of the, the, the time slows down. So you're going to have this, sorry, the opposite, the opposite thing. So one minute for the guy further can be literally uh, hours for the guy closer. So you, you're going to get a completely different kind of um, time uh, scale. So when you get really close to the, to the black hole, time for you kind of stops. So mm -hmm. if someone looks from you from the outside, for you, millions of years can pass. And for the person outside, they, they just see you stopped. I mean, literally, uh, sorry, sorry, you're way around. Uh, yeah. got, got you confused again. Uh, so the time outside can roll out and literally millions of years can pass. And for you, it could just be seconds after before you're actually getting to the horizon. So there's a very weird effect happening in this case, which is called freezing at the horizon. I mean, if you look from outside, an, observing, uh, an observer falling towards a black hole seems to freeze because any they actually pass the horizon as far as we know, they actually cross the horizon in a finite time. They can measure it. For example, you know, they look at their watch, they fall in 10 minutes, but from the outside, you never see them cross. Hmm. You see them moving slower and slower and slower and slower. And at some point, the moment they actually reach the horizon, you see them so slowed down that they're basically frozen there. And all of the light which escapes of them ever entering the horizon never reaches you. Hmm. Because for you to see them cross the horizon light must come out from beyond the horizon so this that is the, still this is the sounds like a like an easy way to die i mean it's not really because um the bad thing there is that Damn what it. is the spaghettification when you get really close to it this effect becomes really strong so literally if you're falling with your feet down you know one minute for your for your foot can be hours for your head uh -huh. So basically, you kind of get distorted and you get kind of spaghettified. This is this is why the effect is called like this. So I've never experienced it, but they say that it's not really nice to to do this. And let's say that this is the the shitty and probably uh, not most optimal way to uh, to die. But this is very unlikely again because yeah. the black hole hitting us directly or coming within its event horizon is almost impossible. Now the other two, they're kind of the same in the end because in one case the black hole does something with our sun eats mm -hmm. it up so we, we let's say we stay gravitational in the solar system but the sun is eaten by the black hole so we still orbit it whatever it is but we have no light and no that's energy. the thing i'd like to, uh, to ask here so i mean even if the black hole is with a, a smaller solar mass yeah. uh, than the sun that's being eaten yeah. let's yeah. let's yeah. imagine not literally our sun but a sun that's like with 100 solar masses so if there's a black hole that's with one solar mass and it gets just plunged yeah. into the sun, what the it's fuck would happen? It. It's completely it's going to destroy destroyed. It. It's going to become a bigger black hole. Yeah. This is the bad thing about it. I mean, if I had a black hole with the size of about a centimeter, it's going to eat the Earth. By the way, a black hole with the size of one centimeter is actually going to have the mass of the Earth, roughly. Huh. So just, just for you to keep in mind, the Earth, if you want to turn it into a black hole, you need to shrink it to about one centimeter radius, so something something this big. Like, uh, and cool. this is there's direct relationship between a black hole size, how big you see it. It doesn't really have a size. This is geometrical. The horizon mm. is a purely geometrical thing, and if you know what its mass is, you know how big the horizon is, mm. because there is a unique relationship. If you want to have this radius of the black stuff of the mm. blacky horizon, you need to have this mass. So that's what I'm saying. That even if it's very tiny, whiny black hole. Um, if it comes close enough, it's, I mean, we're, we're goners. We're fucked. Yeah, we're fucked. Um, if it's, if it's big enough, then it can do some kind of orbital change in the whole solar system, plunge planets out. But from my point of view, yeah, from my point of view, whether we are in a stable system with a black hole in the center with no heat, no warmth, no energy, or we are plunged out, mm -hmm. it's kind of the same thing, almost the same thing. Not, Not exactly, but almost the same thing. Yeah. And here comes the question, can we actually live off without the sun? I mean, if we're plunged out into space, can we actually survive as a society without the sun? For some amount of minutes. It's, well, this is a cool, kind of a cool question. I mean, it's, it's like living on the outer solar system. Can we establish a colony in the moons of Jupiter, for example, or mm. even further out in Neptune? If we could, and probably we have the technology to do it for in some way, because we still have radioactive sources on Earth, Probably some pocket of society can survive in a certain way, but yeah. not in a very, I would say, similar way to ours today here. 
doesn't sound like... Un- unless we develop the technology to do it. Doesn't sound terribly sustainable. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, that's like literally the physical way that um, the universe can, can murder us immediately. But like, um, would you say that there's other dangers lurking in, in the universe? Yeah, there's there's a few which are actually even more... I mean, there's a few which are certain and there's those which are unlikely. So hmm. we were talking so far until the unlikely ones. And the fact is that within the whole lifetime of the solar system, it's very unlikely from our knowledge and observation of other solar systems because we've never seen a sun eaten by a black hole. Uh, we've never seen a planet eaten by a black hole, even hmm. though we have very bad resolution on planets. We don't really see them as planets. We see them just as gravitational jitter. But hmm. we, we can detect something like this, by the way. Um, but the point is that we, we think these are kind of unlikely. Hmm. We don't know about the asteroids so much. We have very small statistics. We know the Earth has been hit by asteroids, but not hard enough to destroy life completely. We know that it's, it's kind of, you know, plunged oh, back. Yeah. So it's been hit a few times. Dinosaurs die, maybe humans die, but yeah. other things crawl up from, yeah. from the remains. But there is stuff which is completely and absolutely going to destroy life on Earth, for example. Like the death of the sun. Yeah. But not the death of the sun from a, from a black hole being swollen, but the natural old age death of the sun. And what I mean by this is um, our sun is a star like any other, so it's consuming fuel. It's being kept, it's, it's a huge ball of nuclear explosion, which is being kept by its own gravity. So at some point it's going to eat its fuel in the center. It, it does something called fission, I'm sure, uh, fusion, I'm sure all of you have heard of fusion, it's the opposite of fission. So fission takes heavy elements and makes them into smaller stuff. Mm. Fusion takes small stuff, makes them into heavy elements. One of them we mastered about a uh, hundred years ago, almost. Uh, the other one we've been mastering for the past 50 years, and every 10 years we say it's going to be in the next 10 years. Yeah. So ho- hopefully, so hopefully, it's, as well. hopefully it's in the next 10 years or 20. Um, but basically, um, fusion is what fuels a star. And once it's its core, its energy source, which is hydrogen being fused under this huge mass with huge temperature, the fusion in the core is trying to explode it. The gravity is trying to contract it. There is a balance between these two. If this balance ends, and naturally it ends when either it gets eaten by a black hole or mm. when the fuel stops in the center, the star dies. And there is a complex process, I won't go into the details, of red giants, white mm. dwarfs. They can, there can be several stages, but eventually what's going to happen with our sun, based on our understanding of literally millions of other suns we've looked at, is that it's going to expand dramatically at at some point in the end Mm. of his life. It's going to become so big that it's going to swallow all the inner planets like Mercury and Venus. It's probably going to come somewhere close to the orbit of Earth. So it's going to be almost as big as the whole orbit of Earth. So it's going to expand literally a few hundred times. And at this point, even if the Earth survives uh, survives as a a rock in space... Mm. Nothing like oxygen or, or similar kind of gases can exist on the, on the surface. It's going to be like the moon, basically. It's going to be a huge, barren rock in space. But there's still optimism, isn't there? I mean, that's technically, we have a bunch of time. We can figure it out, right? I mean, we can probably escape to, let's say, Alpha Centauri or something else, and we'll, we'll figure it out. We'll do yep, some Battlestar yep, Galactica yep. stuff, yeah, etc. But, I mean, this. what would potentially fuck us up in the end? So, so what you're saying, we're going to eventually escape. And keep in mind, this thing, as far as we know today, is absolutely and definitely going to happen to every single star. It just takes a different amount of time. Mm. And for our star, it happens to be relatively small. And that's good because stars are like, I don't know, rock stars. Uh, the, the, gl- the more glorious they are, the bigger they are, the mm. faster they die. And um, uh, it's, it's, it's the fact. I mean, if, if it's a 100 solar masses star... It dies in a few million years. Ours mm. is going to live 10 billion. And it already lived like 5 billion. So we have 5 billion more. Mm. And 5 billion is a shitload of time. I mean, literally, dinosaurs died 64 million years ago. In the course of 5 billion, that's that's nothing. That's, that's a small mm. chunk. So um, 5 billion is a lot. It's, it's like almost half of the lifetime of the universe, as far as we know it. So we have a huge amount of time. I mean, come on. If we haven't escaped the solar system in 2,000 years, I'm going to kill whoever is left here. Not, Jesus. not, not the... Come on, like, we, so we need to do this. But um, we really, I mean, I'm sure that we're going to achieve this. And mm-hmm. let's say in 5 billion years, let's say we have the Battlestar or, or Star Trek or whatever travel. 
even if we just go super slowly and we just shoot small habitats or whatever, mm. uh, micro scale uh, von Neumann probes to build stuff in other worlds, anything like that, we're still gonna have another place. We'll but the, the problem we'll is, will be the disease in the universe, basically. We'll That's be the disease in the universe. You know, yes. we're gonna Excellent. take over. But the problem is that this is gonna happen with other stars as well, and. There is one kind of inevitable, inevitable scenario, which is uh, probably the scariest one, which is that, okay, we escape the Earth, we go to Alpha Centauri, but Alpha Centauri is also going to die. And it's also going to die in a similar way eventually. And other stars are going to do the same. And there's one thing that when stars die, they form these cool nebulae, they form these huge clouds of dust, and new stars can get born from them. But the problem is that every next generation of stars has more heavier elements, what we call metals. By the way, in astronomy, uh, oxygen is a metal. In astronomy, everything heavier than helium is a metal. Astronomy so is very heavy metal. It's Exactly. It's just hydrogen, helium, and then metals. But eventually, the more stars there are, they fuse more elements. From hydrogen, they make heavier elements. And when they die, they make clouds of heavier stuff. So the next generation of stars has heavier stuff. It makes even heavier stuff. And at some point, stuff is so heavy that you have one element, iron, which is not the heaviest, but it's kind of the shittiest, because all the other elements up to iron, when you fuse them, you get energy. Hmm. But iron, when you fuse it, you lose energy. So at some point, if you have a star made of iron, it's, all, it's never going to make energy to support itself against gravity. Hmm. So at some point in the universe, this process of making new generations of stars, it doesn't stop exactly at iron. There's a lot more dynamics. But at some point, the stars are not going to be able to start again from the deaths mm. of the old stars. And this is going to take time. It's going to take literally hundreds of billions of years. But at some point, the last star is going to die, is going to blow up as far as we understand dynamics and nuclear physics and everything else that we know in the universe. And in literally hundreds of billions of years, there is not going to be any more stars. So can we just let, like, manufacture um, an energy source that would keep us alive even after the stars are dead? Well, this is this is kind of the uh, this was the assumption until about ten years ago, that eventually we might do something like this uh, until about ten twenty years ago, that um, you know even if this happens, there's still going to be some black holes in the universe. There's still going to be some raw materials and stuff we can do in a certain way fission to let's say make new clouds of hydrogen mm. if we're uh, the most amazing intergalactic um, society which you know makes new stars mm. and whatever but there is one big problem um, which is that we understand now that the whole universe is expanding faster and faster and we, we have measured this so this came kind of as a surprise 20 years ago because you know we thought that the universe we know that it expands we've known this for a hundred years Hubble saw this but we were thinking that because everything in it is gravitationally bound, it's, it's trying to attract each other, everything pulls everything else, we thought that this acceleration is going to stop at some point and it's going to mm. collapse back. I mean, this is still not a fun scenario to be collapsed back into a black yes. hole the whole universe, but it was still kind of more fun. Uh, but now we, we see that it's actually accelerating faster and faster. And we don't know what's causing this. We literally don't know. I mean, we call it dark energy because we already invented something else called dark matter, which is different, but we still didn't know what it is. So anyway, we call it dark energy, but the weird stuff about it, literally we have, we have like 20 different theories and ideas what it could be, but absolutely no evidence which one of them it is, or at least very little evidence to constrain all of these theories. They could all be true enough, they could all be crap. Um, but basically what it does is, it's kind of like anti-gravity, and it's pushing everything apart. And the bad thing is that, it seems to be getting stronger with time. So it seems to be getting more and more, um, let's say, destructive, mm. the opposite of attractive. Um, and the bad thing is that if it continues like now, so again, this is based on current evidence today, then there's going to be a point in time when it gets so strong that every single molecule is broken. Every single atom then is broken to subatomic particles. And if it, if it really is what we think it is, because we think it's tied in some way to the vacuum, into mm -hmm. the energy of the vacuum, and the more the universe expands, the more vacuum there is and the stronger it becomes. If it really is what we think it is right now, then at some point it's literally going to turn the whole universe into one big empty thing where, as far as we understand, no information can exist. Mm -hmm. And this is bad. Because we can turn ourselves into any kind of processing unit, not be biological at all. We can turn ourselves into, you know, light if you want. But if there is no information possibility in the universe, mm. and this is kind of the ultimate 
sorry about this, but this is kind of the ultimate worst case scenario. No information, it means you can never encode anything. You can never write a bit, a byte, whatever. So you have no way of, literally no all of the elements of the universe are exactly identical. There is no possibility for anything to be different from anything else, which automatically means, it's what we call thermal death, basically. The whole universe is one big constant, which is described by one single state, and nothing changes anywhere. Now, on a, on a brighter note, uh, this thing is, if it happens, based on the current uh, expectations, if it happens with the current data today, this is what we believe is going to happen. Again, I can't say 100%, because we didn't know about the dark energy 20 years ago. 20 years ago, I would have told you 100% we're going to collapse, and I would have been <laughs> probably wrong. And now if I tell you 100%, again, I'm going to lie to you. But if this is, if what we observe continues in this way and we don't find anything new, this is going to happen in 10 to the power of 100 years in the future. So okay, just to understand so... what 10 to the power of 100 years means, it's 10 with 100 zeros years. Now, the universe existed for about 10 to the power of 9 years. So we're talking literally about... Um, a billion, 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 billion times more than the current lifetime of the universe. So by then, I think we're all going to be happy enough and and done everything we want to do in our lives and you know not care so much. Ladies and gents, Viktor Danchev. So, we're back with Positive Vibes Only. Uh, we're back with our guests from abroad, Sabine Roman, who is apparently also a theoretical physicist. As you can see, apparently theoretical physicists are really cheerful dudes, and they tend towards uh, some amount of destruction in their everyday life. Maybe self-destruction, but we're yet to see. Uh, Sabine, um, beyond that, he has a PhD that's related to societal collapse and he has long-term interests into the destruction of humankind, as you will probably see. So, applause for fucking Sabine Roman. Let's go. Also, he's the, uh, he's the beer guy and I'm the water guy, which is kind of depressing. How are you, Sabin? I'm, I'm good. I'm good. I'm uh, happy to be here for uh, Doomsday May. Doomsday May, yes. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a good month for the end of the world. Okay, so Sabin, let's, let's, let's start from the beginning. I mean, uh, what the hell are you studying? I mean, what kind of a thing is this? Who has a PhD in societal collapse? I was just... That's uh, like, come on. It, it, I was fortunate Pick economics enough. or something, agriculture. I, I was just fortunate enough. Like, I, I, I was... Uh, I had an existential crisis in existential... In uh, physics. As one does, yeah. Yeah, as, as you do in, in theoretical physics. And uh, uh, I uh, wanted to do something else. And uh, the end of the world seemed near enough. So it, 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 uh, it formed, like, uh, an interesting point of, uh, of study. So how do we approach this topic? Because obviously we need to uh, introduce people to what the problem is. And I mean, whether if it's one problem or whether if it's uh, some kind of a uh, made up scenario like the ones that Victor mentioned. I mean, is it something that we should be worried about and how does it look like to begin with? Uh, this is get, gets a bit philosophical and this is how I typically start uh, discussing it. Uh, normally, when you think about societal collapse, there are a lot of uh, factors people can say for any given society. For example, the Roman Empire, you think the Germanic tribes attacked them and that, that caused the collapse. But it's not so simple. Because if you're to write, a, uh, for example, a, a thesis on the collapse of Rome, are you just going to write about the Germans? Right? The, you got to mention mm. Rome at some point in there. Mm. So yeah. the, the internal dynamics and what happens within it is important. And you need to understand this endogenous aspect. And you can't just lay all the blame on some external thing. Mm -hmm. It's it, the goals. Yeah, yeah. So it's, uh, for example, even the, uh, the extinction of the dinosaurs. You mm -hmm. think, okay, it was just an asteroid and it killed them. Not, not, I mean, that doesn't cover the, it doesn't explain why something survived. 
So for the dinosaurs, you needed to account for the ecological niche that they uh, uh, existed in, and uh, other species did not have that ecolo e ecological niche and they survived, like small mammals. And that's the reason we're here. Mm. So focusing on this is, is key. And uh, funny enough, the first picture I have actually I, I shared was also the solar system. And uh, if you want to go uh, and, and understand what are the internal drivers in, in a society, you need to, um, it, it's a, it's, it seems like an in, in uh, insurmountable task. There's so many possible things that could factor into human decision making that, you know, having predictions over centuries, it seems like a completely unfeasible thing. Completely like, well, what's the point? Like, we barely know what happens in 10 years. How can mm. we know what happens in 100 or 1,000? Yeah. It's too complex, basically. It's too complex, and you'd think that it's completely in intractable. Mm. And uh, the same actual problem happens for all sciences. Uh, we didn't know what the hell we were doing for most of human history. I still don't. Oh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you can get philosophical about it. But scientifically, we only really got a hang of it um, when we started looking at the solar system. And this was actually the first system we managed to quantify and understand and be able to predict over the long term, uh, centuries and millennia. And uh, actually, the Maya were pretty successful in this regard as well. And uh, the thing about the solar system is uh, it's its scale. If you go uh, at a large enough scale, then things tend to simplify. It's basically you can see the forest instead of the trees. On planet Earth, most phenomena involve two major forces, electromagnetism and gravity. Electromagnetism makes things very messy. Like you have all of chemistry, all of uh, electrical phenomenon and, and magnetism, and things are very hard to quantify. Uh, and it took us quite a few centuries to get the, uh, a handle on it. With gravity on their hand, on their hand uh, is the only thing that survives over long scales. Uh, and at this level of the solar system, that actually gives a much simpler perspective on, on the dynamics. And my whole sort of uh, exercise was to find something similar for societies. Can we find an equivalent force of gravity that operates over long time scales and gives us some insight on how the system can behave? And uh, it's only in that regime that you can really get some predictive power. Otherwise, it seems like a hopeless endeavor. And this was my search. Can we find something that looks like gravity in, this, in terms of social forces? And uh, I think uh, there's some very good candidates in this regard. It's basically you're the most standard kind of phys physicist. I mean, he looks at physics and he said, let me fix the world with literally all the different kind of... of complex problems with my knowledge in physics. Basically, yeah. But you got to be careful what you take from physics and you put it into the social sciences. Yeah. If you go too directly, it, it might not form a good, a good match. Um, so what is societal collapse? The, the, the question. <laughs> what, what is it? Um, it's a rapid and significant decrease in levels of social political complexity. So there's nothing particularly surprising about the definition except the word complexity. And uh, defining what society complexity is, is a tricky business. Hmm. And uh, my, in physics and in sort of adjacent fields, uh, the notion of complexity has something like 50 definitions. Hmm. And you need some, um, uh, the appropriate way to look at it if you want to get some uh, somewhere. The... Um, Notion of complexity that is most appropriate uh, has to do with how we solve problems. And uh, the way we solve problems is we typically specialize, we coordinate, and we do it at the adequate scale, so in mm. large enough numbers. And this is our general meta strategy for approaching any issue, either in the company or personally or at any level. Mm. We tend to specialize and coordinate and uh, organize at, at the adequate numbers. Mm. Separation and, uh, of uh, different kinds of specialization. Yeah, yeah. yeah. division of labor in, in various yeah. forms. So uh, and this is actually not just specific to societies. Um, and the same strategy applies in uh, biological systems and in evolution. And uh, to make the example m uh, more clear, I uh, look at ants. Hmm. The, the, there are two contrasting species. One is called Myrmicocrypta, which is over here. They were really quick, by the way. You said yeah, yeah, ants and it's like, boom. Yeah, really yeah. good. And uh, what's interesting about them is uh, 
the actually what, what's least interesting about them is that they have very small colonies, like 100 members. They only go a few meters from their nest, and they not very specialized. They have uh, basically most members and the queen, so pretty flat. Uh, on the other hand, uh, what's interesting is they obtain their nitrogen sources from very high quality resources, which is insect droppings. Doesn't seem fabulous for us, but for them it's it's, it's great. And uh, uh, this uh, is a simple system essentially, but it benefits from very good uh, energy resources. On the other hand, you can contrast this with uh, another type of species, which is called the atta ants. And these are much more famous. They're the ants from the uh, Amazon forest that carry leaves. And you can see, see trails of them for hundreds of meters around. So what they, the, what they do is uh, they, their colonies are, have millions of members, so like much larger scale. They have at least five different types of, of ants within the colonies and they can go hundreds of meters. Mm -hmm. So they're very, very well organized, you know, to carry all this stuff. And they carry actually hundreds of pounds of, of leaves in their, in their other ground uh, colonies, and which huge, you know, like uh, caverns inside uh, the earth. So why, 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 why all that complexity? Well, it's because of the nitrogen source. It's, it's in the leaves that they gather, and it's actually very poor. And they need all that complexity to harvest very scarce environments, energy from very scarce environments. And uh, basically, complexity is a tool. And the harsher the conditions you, you, you find yourself in, the more complex you have to get. Hmm. And this is the evolutionary spiral. Uh, if you find yourself in very abundant uh, environments, then you need to keep it simple. You don't need any, any, any more. Hmm. If, it, if the, the going gets tough, you, you, need, uh, you need to invest in complexity. And this is a universal pattern. Uh, you can find it in biological system, you can find it in technological systems. And one contrast, uh, one uh, industry I like, like to look at is the oil industry. Uh, at the Belief at the beginning of the 20th century, um, you know, there was this show in Hollywood called the uh, Hollywood Hillbillies. Um, it's like Hollywood this, Hillbillies. It's, yeah, it's like uh, basically some... Um, uh, I just know Dallas. Yeah, so. no, no, no. This is like way before Dallas. Uh, mm -hmm. It's like just some uh, basically peasants from uh, the countryside uh, uh, come across uh, like uh, they sh they actually shoot in a, in a marshland and uh, the oil comes gushing out. And uh, basically they got rich overnight and they mm -hmm. moved to Hollywood. And uh, uh, that's the way oil used to be discovered at the beginning of the century. And you have uh, now Rockefeller and everyone getting super rich out of zero effort, basically. Well, that and some greed. But um, then uh, if you go fast forward 100 years and you want to get the same stuff, you need to basically go in the middle of the ocean, drink, uh, drill for miles uh, underneath the ocean floor, and you get something like uh, the, the Gulf Mexico disaster, hmm. potentially. But uh, you just compare the efforts that you need to, to do it. In one case, you need some hillbilly with a shotgun to uh, poke a hole in the ground. And the other one, you need uh, a big, massive oil rig with uh, uh, thousands of people highly specialized and trained and a very coordinated effort to be able to get essentially the same stuff out, out of the ground. Mm -hmm. And uh, this shows um, evo 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 an evolutionary spiral. Uh, if your system is simple, then you can only really access uh, high quality, abundant energy resources. And the moment those disappear, you need to grow in complexity to be able to continue this game and to be able to harness this, these uh, energy resources. So basically the complexity here is not only the cost of extraction, because obviously if you're addressing this uh, with uh, like an oil rig and like uh, additional like tankers being shipped, you know, a bunch of wages, investment in R&D, etc. The, the complexity is actually figuring how to get to the whole thing. So it's both know-how and uh, investment as compared to the potential benefit. Yes, yes, it's, uh, it's multidimensional. Hmm. Uh, and uh, I, I'm just presenting it at, at, at the qualitative basis level. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, yeah, it, 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 you, the, the more, it has to span multiple uh, dimensions and otherwise we wouldn't manage to get it. Hmm. Uh, funny enough, if we were to sort of stop extracting oil for whatever reason and we used up all the, our reserves, then we couldn't actually start up the industry again. 
because uh, there's there would be no sort of hillbilly type of resource mm. we could access, mm. like shooting something no in abundant the ground. resource. Yeah, there's no, there would be no low hang, low hanging fruit. Mm. So um, uh, yeah, in a way we we find ourselves on a on, on what we're walking a plank, and uh, it's it's uh, we're very far away from 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 safety. If we stop the process, then we can't really restart it. Mm. So we're, we we have to continue. And uh, uh, yeah, this is the general spiral actually of uh, uh, complexity and energy. It's it's a feedback mechanism where. Uh, the more complex you get, the more energy you need, and uh, actually you need the complexity to be able to access the energy itself, and the scarcer the resource becomes. So and it keeps going, and with uh, this, per- and, and this, this also happens with uh, on evolutionary timescales for species, and uh, but uh, there you have like a, a larger diversity of strategies that can manifest. For us, we're only sort of increasing in complexity, and uh, yeah. Uh, the um, uh, I forgot what uh, what the next part is. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> okay. So, so I mean, uh, you're trying to basically uh, make an analogy with uh, you know with the ants and everything else that basically everything in the world works like this. I mean, if we're investing into complexity, um, essentially all of our endeavors are investing into complexity in some sense, and that plank is basically us. So we're back to the positive vibes. Um, Positive vibes. <laughs> <laughs> they, they stay positive for a while, but they, they just keep on decreasing. Yes. Um, yeah, so I included this graph uh, that this uh, phenomenon of diminishing returns through investments in complexity is not limited just to physical resources. It's not just, it doesn't just get harder to find oil, for example. Hmm. Our big faith is in, is in technology and uh, or technological innovation or scientific discovery. This is like our new god of sorts. And uh, uh, the thing is, the same phenomenon occurs there as well. And as a physicist, I can give an example that uh, the discovery of, of the electron required one guy in one lab with some wires and basically found, found the most useful particle of all of them. Hmm. Uh, if you contrast it with the discovery of the Higgs, you need thousands of people and $10 billion and a huge accelerator to find something we, we've been expecting for 50 years. Hmm. And uh, the level of um, innovation and um, revolution the, the Higgs boson got us was much smaller. Like it, hmm. it basically confirmed what we already knew. So there's no long hanging fruits in physics, basically. Uh, no, not, not really, not really. And uh, if you look at uh, the grand unified theories, uh, they mostly predict some long, there, there's basically nothing to discover for very many uh, energy scales mm. and mm. not really accessible with Earth, Earth-bound technology. And uh, one more, much more uh, maybe relevant example would be in the pharmaceutical industry. If you plot the effectiveness of spending versus scientific discoveries in, in pharmaceuticals, you find this, this, this graph, which was the one prior, actually, with the, this, the, the, with the diminishing uh, returns. Uh, you basically, what the graph showed was, uh, versus 70 years ago, um, you need to spend 1,000 times more, or maybe even 10,000 times more, if you want to discover as many uh, drugs as you discovered in, in, in the 1950s. So the cost is much, much, much larger. And this is not due to inflation or some other factors. It has to do with the actual landscape of possible discoveries. That we picked up all the low-hanging fruit, and it's the high, uh, high ones that are much, much more difficult to access. And they, they prove much less effective than the low-hanging fruit, like, for example, penic- penicillin mm. or mm, most... Uh, most commonly used antibiotics. Isn't there an argument that there could be something that's uh, difficult to get to, but end of the day, it's much more worth it comparatively to the effort as uh, the low-hanging fruit? Um, a meritocratic society would make, make you think so. The harder you work, the more you get. But it doesn't work like that. <laughs> not, not, not in, um, not, 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 not as far as we can see mm. in terms of the data. Uh, if you want to work, win a Nobel Prize, it was much more beneficial to be born at the beginning of the 20th century <laughs> than at the end. Yeah. The, the, if you just had a PhD at the beginning of the 20th century, odds were you could, you could uh, yeah. sort of make your way to a Nobel Prize. But, but it's also because there's much more jerks doing the same thing. So uh, nowadays, yeah. Mm. Nowadays, yeah. So um, the, the the it's much m- more of a matter of uh, of 
timing rather than uh, actual effort. Uh, if you if you start off early, then the, all the chances are in your favor. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, yeah, we, we like to think about human capacity for our intellect to be like the, the, the defining factor that drives the world and makes the big changes. Mm. But it's not really that. <laughs> it's actually the underlying geography, either physically or um, in the sort of, let's say, the special, in the mental realm. That's uh, not observable directly, but we explore it for our, our, our scientific efforts. And uh, this paints a different picture of uh, what's possible. So even the fact that we're growing in, in number, so there's way m more people um, in the world in general, but also there's way more specialized people in the different disciplines. This doesn't count, and the fact that they're figuring out new technologies, they interact between each other, etc. This doesn't counteract the effect of complexity on the potential discoveries. Um, it just uh, shows we've increased in complexity to be able to access the, those much more difficult discoveries. Mm. But that doesn't mean the discoveries are uh, are sufficient or enough or that great for that matter. But doesn't that mean that basically we are reaching some kind of a slowdown of growth? Yes. Yes, exactly. And uh, this is why uh, most societies collapse, because they're in denial of that. Okay, so... Okay, so and, uh, basically what you... Yeah, th this is the next graph, actually, the one on with limits to growth. The, 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 there was a study done in the 1970s that actually quantified okay. uh, a lot of the feedbacks that underlie our uh, societal development. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the study wasn't meant to be predictive. It was mostly meant to be cautionary. Uh, and uh, it, it came up with these tra trajectories that were compared with uh, real data. And it, with the data tracks, the, the, the model tracks the data pretty well for the last 40, 50 years. And uh, yeah, we're on our way to uh, not, not so prosperous future uh, in, the, in the second half of the century. So we can still chill for a while. It's not, it's not that bad yet. Um, the, the question is, uh, why don't we stop? So if we know about these diminishing returns and we actively feel them, because, for example, the pharmaceuticals industry like, uh, uh, spends many more billion dollars than it used to, and the same with the oil, and, uh, oil industry, why don't we stop? <laughs> why, what prevents us from mm. uh, carrying on this path that seems to be less and less beneficial? And the, que the answer is uh, the same for every other past society. The, 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 the growth phase of the, of the system, when we had very good returns on, on investment, uh, basically set up all our institutions, our norms, our paradigms to be in favor of this investment mm. because it proved so good in the past, it has to be, I mean, we are expecting it to be just as good in the future. Mm. But it, it, it's actually less and less. Uh, and um, in the case of ancient Rome, um, their initial conquests was, were very beneficial. They could eliminate taxations for citizens. It was uh, hunky-dory for 500 years or so until um, uh, the moment they expanded a bit too much beyond the Mediterranean basis, the costs of expansion were actually greater than the benefits. And to continue, but because they had all these institutions invested into military conquest, they had to fund this con continuously. And to do that, they didn't actually have the financial resources, so what they did is they debased their, their currency. Hmm. Something um, basically printing more money, essentially, but what they did was uh, reduce the silver content of the coins. So initially they were pure silver, and then they introduced copper. And what this allows you to do is increase the monetary supply while maintaining purchasing power for a short time until inflation catches up. And then uh, once inflation catches up, you do the same. <laughs> and you basically debase the currency, you increase the, silver co the copper content uh, over time, and uh, in around two centuries, they were, the coins were essentially worthless. And this meant they could no longer fund their military campaigns, and the empire collapsed. And, yeah, but uh, let, let, yeah. let, let me stop you for a second. So basically what you're saying is that the Roman Empire's resource, uh, in the same sense that, that we're talking about oil, etc., yeah. yeah. is conquest. I mean, just going fucking up somebody in Gaul is basically your resource. And one, there's, there's not much to pillage in Gaul, you're basically screwed. 
Um, well, goal was very, very, very good actually. Yeah. Uh, the, the when you got to the German side it was a bit more difficult. It was more difficult to have transport there because the rivers were not as favorable. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, essentially, the, they had the one track uh, sort of policy. It's mm. the common policy throughout the entire uh, span of the empire. Go for if you had a problem and you had to solve it, you needed money. You go and conquer some neighbors, you get some more slaves, you get some more gold, you get some more territory and taxation, problem solved. Mm. And this worked. This worked great for like hundreds of years. But mm. uh, then it, 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 it stopped. The problem is that there was a social inertia created mm. that was not, uh, was not uh, it couldn't be just be halted or modified or reformed on, on a whim. But uh, we keep giving examples in the past with like the Roman Empire. Is this... I mean, can we imagine any other civilization working in the same sense? Uh, yes, yes. So the the, the general feedbacks um, uh, operates in a similar way. It's just the the uh, the measure of complexity changes. So, mm. for example, if you look at the Maya, their most of their efforts were actually invested into advanced agricultural techniques. So they had terraces and all sorts of funky ways to. Um, uh, use the land hmm. that allowed them to maximize agricultural output in a very poor so for very poor soils, hmm. and uh, they they pushed that as much as they could, but at some point they they, they gave out. So hmm. and uh, drought is a is an often um, uh, is a is a is a often um, mentioned as a cause of their collapse. But um, they put themselves in the most vulnerable possible situation beforehand. So mm -hmm. irrespective of drought happened or not, they were doing the worst possible thing they could do to their uh, environment. Mm -hmm. So drought might, might have exacerbated some effects, uh, but the population levels were, were, were already too high. And they had little choice except doing this very intensive type of agriculture. And um, yeah, uh, and that, that actually sets up a paradigm that operates for hundreds of years. And because of the uh, labor force and the very high returns initially, they could build mon monuments, they could have all sorts of these uh, uh, extended uh, uh, activity that was not typical from, of the past, and that seemed pretty cool. <laughs> and the same goes for us. And for us, the underlying paradigm is economic growth. So uh, we take economic growth as being the go-to strategy. Hmm. If you look at any political leader and any speech they ever gave, You'll, they will mention economic growth as the number one priority that we must aim for. Hmm. And uh, irrespective of that, you know, causing climate change and being unsustainable, uh, it's still sort of tooted as the, as the solution to all our problems. Mm -hmm. And uh, this goes to the, prob to the issue of why we don't stop. And it has to do with some costs. The... Um, uh, this is a general fallacy that psychologists have identified uh, for human beings. Uh, and this is like a suggestive little picture. Um, the, the, your your, your um, prior investments bias your future decisions. And this is... Uh, this is particular, this is uh, manifest at an individual level, but it's even stronger when it comes to groups. So reaching a consensus, signing a contract, um, even having a baby, these are uh, commitments over the long term. And uh, it, they bind you to a certain uh, pathway that is not easy to change. Hmm. And th these... A baby is a sunk cost. Uh, huge, huge, Jeez. huge sunk cost. Yeah. Well, if you're a good parent, at least. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the, this uh, sets up... Uh, a lot of inertia in the system because, uh, for example, most of the contracts now on, on planet Earth with derivatives and every financial instrument you can imagine, they require us to extract resources for the next 20, 30 years and sort of the status quo keeping um, keep going like as, as it is. And billions and even trillions of dollars depend on this. So, uh, you know, <laughs> this is not something easy to, to just uh, change. We're basically mining the future. Yeah, we're basically mining the future. And uh, if you think about modern society, um, there are at least big for some costs that, you, uh, that I've, I've sort of know, I identified over the, the, our, our history. Um, the, the first one that I'd say would appeared was during the Renaissance, 
where we sort of displaced God as the center of the universe and we placed man. This started to be a good idea, but um, uh, in all likelihood, the, the Renaissance could have been of just a golden period like ancient Greece. Hmm. The, what made it different was that it was followed by the Industrial Revolution. And the Industrial Revolution basically said that technology is the highest expression of our ingenuity and can solve all our problems. So on this, um, you, you put man at the center of the universe, then you put technology as the solution to all, all our problems. And given the industrial uh, expansion, um, you can put on, that, uh, on top of that economic growth. Hmm. So you can put any m m financial metric to an ever expanding material basis and the money supply will also grow organically with no inflation. Mm. So you have economic growth, and uh, uh, that is a good time for everyone, um, except in when the growth ends, <laughs> or you cannot finance it anymore, mm. uh, for whatever reason. And then you need this financial instrument called debt. <laughs> and debt is uh, quite, um, uh, is, is, I would say, the last paradigm that we added on top, and that we're using today at the maximum because we're basically borrowing for the future to, uh, on the hopes that the future is so great we can pay off all the debt. Mm. And you, we're using that to finance our present endeavors. Um, and uh, yeah, this is the first, uh, in, in potential collapse, this is the first thing that would uh, be um, a hit. And the 2008 crisis was a signal of that. Mm. Uh, in the future, depending how well we reform the system, which I don't think we have, uh, we should expect future um, shocks in that regard, mostly through the financial system and this paradigm of economic growth. Technology still serves us, and it will serve us probably for a very long time before we actually challenge it as an underlying paradigm. And even longer than that, uh, our belief in our own ingenuity and creativity. Hmm. And uh, yeah, that's um, those are some of the sunk costs that will, will unfold. But... Uh, the major issue is with the financial sector and the economic growth for the foreseeable future. So basically, one of the potential solutions to this is degrowth, I guess. Yes, but that requires reforming uh, all the ideas in economics. Mm -hmm. Basically, you have to redefine everything we think about what constitutes our, uh, the way society functions, the way you finance uh, any economic endeavor. Most mm -hmm. companies or most starts up require some level of debt mm -hmm. uh, to, to, to get started. And uh, they even, you know, bank loans for houses and mortgages and all that. Uh, there is fundamental the system. So imagining something that doesn't have all those aspects is quite a challenge and uh, not exactly uh, uh, entertained even. <laughs> I mean, not, not, not to say, not to, it's not even, I, I don't know any serious endeavor to actually reform mm, the financial mm. sector to that extent. So um, what are our options? I mean, how, how does this look like? I mean, what's our perspective on the future? Uh, well, I will say one more cautionary aspect regarding these sunk costs, just mm -hmm. to, just to uh, say how deep in, deeply ingrained they are. There is one picture of a monkey <laughs> that I added to the, to the, to the uh, just after this one, actually. Yeah. So the reason I added this one um, is I saw this uh, documentary uh, about safaris and uh, uh, they focused on this uh, group of monkeys and one of the females had an offspring die. And surprisingly, they didn't just discard it or like mind it, do something else. It actually took the uh, body and carried it with it for about around three weeks until it completely decayed. And this was very weird. Why would a monkey carry another dead monkey for that long? Because it's extra mass, so it's an extra weight, you, you, it smells, you ca it would uh, attract predators, it slows you down. So it makes little sense, why would you carry a, a dead body around for that long? And I, start, I, I, I thought about this, and uh, the only reason I, that made sense was that uh, evolutionary, uh, you, the the monkeys that paid most attention and was more, more devoted to their offspring ensured um, a higher s chance of survival for them. Hmm. So all their neural pathways and, and their the brain development calibrated in such a way that they had a disproportionate devotion to their offspring. And the more careful they were with them, the, higher, the, the more likely they were to survive. This has though an offshoot that the moment uh, the, the offspring dies, then you still have all that attachment there. 
and it doesn't go away. And uh, it proved so beneficial in the past, the, all the pathway, neural pathways are there. And uh, you're gonna keep carrying the dead baby, the dead, de the dead baby with you, even beyond uh, the point of any mm. uh, reason. And uh, this uh, I included because it shows how deep these sunk costs are and how, how difficult it is to actually uh, come out of them. And most, most of my discussions on collapse, like from the vast majority, go back to technology and how it can save us, mm -hmm. which is the, one of the fundamental paradigms that uh, this attacks. And um, it's, it's, a fair, it's a fair question. I mean, uh, uh, we're gonna milk that cow as much as we can. And uh, yeah, it's, it, it's, it served us and it will keep serving us for a while more. But um, there's this humbleness that should be developed and maybe broader perspective on, on life and on uh, what you actually consider wor worthwhile. So basically, your perspective is, even if we manage to improve technology, let's say we develop uh, fusion, as we spoke with Victor, uh, essentially this would just um, delay uh, the collapse. I mean, it would uh, create some amount of... Uh, um, <laughs> this would delay um, uh, this collapse, but it wouldn't necessarily negate it. Um. No, it wouldn't. And this is um, looking at, at uh, different limits. So when uh, we think about collapse, we often think about uh, physical resources. Hmm. We depleted the oil or some energy resource, and we need more of it. And with fusion, this would ensure us a very uh, long-term prosperous future in terms of energy, hmm. because we have all the oceans on the planet and Europa and stuff in the solar hmm. system. and. Uh, uh, it can be a good time for a very long time, and you have a galactic empire or whatever. But there's actually some other limitations that come from our own psychology. And uh, more generally, any, the psychology of any mammal, or maybe even in any species. And this has to do with um, another figure I introduced there, another psychological aspect that's uh, maybe overlooked, and, uh, but might be uh, quite important. Um, there's this um, experiment with mice that was done in the 70s and uh, it showed um, something very intriguing. So they put a few mice in this utopic environment, they provided all the food that they wanted, all the space that they wanted, everything was as, as good as it gets basically. Yeah, I mean. Uh, yeah, it, 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 uh, it, they cleaned up. After them, it was like, no, they, they could just live, there's like no, no, no stress whatsoever. And the mice multiplied and everything was going well. And uh, uh, at some point they reached about two thirds of the carrying capacity of the, of the enclosure. So there was plenty of space left. There was no, no problem in that regard. But all of a sudden they started, they stopped reproducing. And uh, completely. <laughs> and they eventually just all grew old and died. And uh, you're kind of puzzled of why. Hmm. Normally, what you'd expect is the population would reach some equilibrium, Plateau. and then it would stay there, and things would be just fine. But that didn't happen. And the, if you look closer, um, the, uh, the mice have a specific hierarchy. So uh, there's the alpha, and then uh, a whole bunch of other roles that they, they might have, and the females, and um, it's, it's, um, it, it's a system that uh, uh, has its own roles that have to be filled. And the way those roles are fulfilled is um, uh, through some competition between the members. They fight, then they try to establish their dominance hierarchy. And uh, once this dominance hierarchy is established, then the males can send some... Uh, biological signaling to the females, and then the mating can start and they can have offspring. The problem is, in the enclosure that they, were found, they, they found themselves, um, the, there is one picture of, I think I added to about the enclosure. The, um, the yeah, yeah, so this is the, the, the mice with the, all the food that they needed. Um, the, the problem was uh, because of their high density, they would keep on fighting. So even if a hierarchy was established, it was only temporary until more fighting, more fighting occurred. And there was no um, equilibrium there. It, they would just be competing endlessly for dominance. 
And uh, in that case, uh, they could never end up doing the right mating rituals to, to reproduce. And also, because of all the stress, the females could hardly get any, uh, pregnant anymore. And uh, basically, this uh, they, they died. Uh, not from any given sort of natural cause, but this emerging cultural stagnation of sorts. Mm. And uh, the, the, the article that describes this is called Death Squared. Because uh, it's, it's some... It's, it's a sort of a death, type of death that you're not normally envisioned. It's basically total war. Uh, what? It's total war. Yes, a total war of sorts, yeah. Yeah, but the mice version, so they didn't have shields or helmets or stuff like that. That would be cool. That would be very cool, yeah. Uh, in, our, in, our, in our case, um, you could uh, think that we also surpassed this threshold. Mm. So the Middle Ages saw a pretty, let's say, constant but fluctuating uh, population. Um, so uh, something around 500 to a billion people, more or less, uh, and uh, you had the Black Plague and these uh, events that sort of perturbed uh, the equilibrium. But uh, I th the equilibrium was still there. Uh, sort of the maximum number of people, the number of primates you'd expect for a species of our size. Uh, the thing is, that's, this threshold was exceeded. And the moment it was exceeded, you had these uh, global wars. Hmm. Like, uh, for example, the Seven Year War, which is actually maybe the First World War, if you were to count hmm. it properly. And uh, the, this fighting kept on going until um, the Industrial Revolution, which again saw actually even more war, but then a, a moment of uh, stability. And uh, the, the thing about the mice is if you, have, if you give them toys and you give them more roles to fulfill, like artistic endeavors and uh, uh, playing with each other or something, then they, um, they, they, it alleviates this um, social pressure. Mm -hmm. they, they have more stuff to do, more, more roles to fulfill, and the uh, higher population is sustainable. And arguably the Industrial Revolution functioned like this for us, in that uh, it allowed us to diversify our roles sufficiently to be okay in that mm. regard and not fight as much. Keep uh, ourselves busy. Yes, keep ourselves busy in mm. a meaningful yeah. meaningful way. Uh, there is this book uh, called Bullshit Jobs that uh, yeah. uh, mm. like sort of redundant things, people jobs that people are doing, and uh, yeah, they, they might be pro pro proliferating. That's very much into this idea of reaching these uh, uh, social social capital limits, mm. and uh, yeah, and uh, the, the the issue generally, more generally speaking, is that the mice are traumatized, mm -hmm. in uh, in their yeah. So if you took them out of the enclosure and put them in a healthy environment, uh, the, the they didn't actually adapt and they didn't become normal behaving. The the trauma was so deeply ingrained that they they could not unlearn it, and this is. Um, a deep aspect of uh, that mm, is affecting us as well. Uh, the, the thing is, in our case, the manifestation of trauma is a bit more complex, uh, but it's still there. And uh, the the yeah, it's uh, it forms another uh, aspect that um, uh, another predict another aspect of, of our predictability. So it's not just some cost, but this added aspect of mm -hmm. uh, of. Uh, 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 trauma tends to manifest in highly predictable, repeatable behavior under mm -hmm. the same uh, stimuli. So the, it, it tends to dampen uh, our sort of creative and inno innovation of sorts. In so basically the problem is us on our accounts. It's both this, it's also the concept of not letting go, so sunk costs, etc. Yeah. So again, yeah. how does the future look like then? I mean, how do we handle this? <sighs> this is... Um, this is tricky. <laughs> um, the, um, I, I've been um, throwing this problem at people in various guises and mm. uh, to various extents, and uh, I'm still thinking. <laughs> I'm still thinking. I have some ideas of what we could do, but um, there's nothing very pretty. One, one good thing, and this is what I'm, my work tries to do, um, is build... Um, um, alternative systems of uh, macro uh, societal and economic behavior hmm. and um, basically find alternatives to our current way of doing things. Most of the solutions that we, we try to envision um, keep this paradigm of economic growth and just focus on the technological factors We're trying to make that happen. Hmm. If we just revise the underlying paradigms of the economic growth and have something like a steady state economy 
then this this could be much more sustainable. Hmm. There is a problem with that. Uh, economic growth. Of course, there is. Yes, yeah, there is always there's no free lunch, really. Uh, with economic growth, you have ever extend expanding possibilities. So hmm. if you're not happy with your job, in a few years there'll be some other job that hmm. does something else, and you can go there. And um, the the problem with uh, uh, steady states in history is uh, you have a few examples of these, and this would be India and Japan. And they, they are, these are societies that never really experienced the collapse. And one, I think, key factor f because of, for that is uh, the very strict social hierarchy that they had. So caste systems and uh, very, diff very little social mobility. So very deeply ingrained type of some costs that were very prohibitive of, of disruptions. Mm. So they would not allow things from the outside really to change them. Mm -hmm. And uh, this kept them robust and stable over time and more or less stable populations and uh, maybe they had some revolutions and stuff, but nothing uh, collapsed level like. And um, uh, it's, it's sustainable, but you're kind of stuck. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Because <laughs> the, you're rigid. You're basically. rigid, yeah. yeah. And um, maybe there would be uh, societies that we can envision that would, might be more flexible in certain regards. Plato probably f uh, formalized it the best in the Republic and having this utopia where you, you, t you tell the myth of the metals where uh, people born in a, in a copper family can move to a uh, golden family. Yes, and the golden a, family. Yeah, and um, you can have this uh, uh, alloys and uh, move around, but it's, it was essentially a utopia. <laughs> um, uh, beyond that, I'm, um, I'm, not, uh, I'm not sure. Um, there's some more nefarious ways to go about this and it has to do with the way society is structured and uh, uh, what are the power, power um, uh, leverage points, let's say, mm. in, in, the, in the power centers in it. Uh, but, um, yeah, maybe we can leave that to the discussion because it's, it, it, yeah, it's more, much more speculative. So, so we can segue slightly into the uh, discussion with uh, Victor, who should be putting on his mic at this point. Um, would you say that it's only social? I mean, is it, uh, yeah, is it, is it uh, something that if we just change ourselves, we have an option to get out of this? Uh, in principle, I would say yes. It's just the likelihood of that happening is extremely small. <laughs> like, extremely small. The... If we could, you know, add something to the food that sort of boosts our brain capacity and cognition by a factor of, a, of 10 or something, that makes us heal trauma and mm. uh, uh, maybe not abide by authority as much and, I don't know, makes us all radical and rebels, yeah. then maybe something can happen. So, shockingly, so, you're not an optimist. I'm not really an optimist. And there's another, the, my last slide, actually. Uh, it, 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 it's a way to memorize most of the things I said. And it makes a link with uh, thermodynamics. Um, there is so the laws of thermodynamics. They're quite uh, like they're they're probably the most uh, uh, um, uh, unbeatable laws in all of physics. Mm -hmm. And most yeah, the most difficult to to change to, to be challenged. Even Einstein said this. Like he was not so kind of confident in gravity or anything else, but with with thermodynamics, he was very very uh, at ease. And uh, the, the laws can be framed by, like, like this. The society is an open thermodynamic system, and we don't really have laws for thermodynamics for open systems, but um, I, I thought this rephrasing would, is useful. So the first law, the zero law, which is not included here, is that there is a game. And this game involves energy. And uh, what I described with the complexity and energy spiral, that increasing complexity and diminishing returns to... to to it uh, is, is essentially the nature of the game. And this is the game we're playing as a, as a general thermodynamic system. The first law is that you can't win this game. And you can't win it because you don't have infinite resources. Hmm. You, you can only really win it in, the, in that scenario. Secondly, you can't break even. Uh, and this is because resources are distributed asymmetrically. So even if you were to spread out and, and uh, uh, equalize everything, it wouldn't really be enough for everyone. And secondly, uh, the symmetry in the system um, 
it doesn't it may, makes it hides the underlying scarcity and it makes you much more likely to blame the your your neighbors that seem to have a bit more. And uh, the this would lead to in fight to fighting like with the mice. And um, yeah, you can't really break even. There's no um, uh, you can't even do that. And uh, the last part is you can't stop the game. And uh, this is expressed in the sunk costs. Uh, we have these ingrained uh, paradigms that have proved useful in the past, and they're proving less and less useful for the future. But we we st we, we stick to them, and uh, that means we 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 don't we can't stop playing the game. And as a colorate all of this, you're basically perpetually losing. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Well, ladies and gentlemen, Sabin. So, as I uh, mentioned, it's time for the Q&A now. Uh, again, go to the website sly.do with the code BOOM and you can ask your questions to uh, two positive guys over here. <laughs> so, um, I was trying to figure out just before uh, going into the Q&A, do you two guys, I mean, you both have the same background. I mean, do you have some uh, obvious connect on something that's also doom and gloomy as as our event so far. I mean, would you say that you have something that uh, is a common topic you could probably discuss? I think that we actually reached the same conclusion, just for different systems. I mean, what I was reaching to in the end, the heat death of the universe, is essentially the same thermodynamic laws, but applied to uh, to the universe scales of energy, because this heat death. The original definition and kind of formulation of this, even before we knew about dark mm. energy as a concept, was exactly that entropy is going to keep increasing. And uh, so, so I think that this is actually really interesting that we reached on a, on a physical system in terms of the universe and on a society system, which is a subset of the universe, the same end result, more or less. Which, knowing that we're both physicists and we have this aspect, I don't think it's so surprising yeah. uh, for the long-term evolution. But also it's interesting, I, I just want to mention a, a story that if you, if you haven't read after today, mm -hmm. and if you want to be a little more optimistic after today, because I think mine was actually the optimistic part uh, after this. But <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if, if we Thank live you. to see the if we live to see the end of the of the sun or whatever, I mean, it's uh, society. It's it's, good it's, enough. It's, it's it's a great thing. But um, check this story by Isaac Asimov called "The Last Question," because I think a lot of what we said, both in terms of society and uh, you, you know it, okay, both in terms of society and the universe, it, it's kind of encapsulated there. So I, I want I don't want to spoil anything, but it's. I mean, the guy was actually a genius, because if you think about it, Isaac Asimov predicted a lot of the stuff you said in terms of um, his uh, foundation, um, and, 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 this, and this small story that I'm saying, basically, if you read Isaac Asimov's foundation and this small story called The Last Question, you know everything you need to know about what we talk about tonight. <laughs> um, I find it interesting that we, we, we started from the same slide, actually, with the solar system and the same sort of a general, uh, yeah. and we ended on the same conclusion. We came yeah. full circle. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, full yeah, circle, yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, the different pathways, essentially, but yeah. Okay, so time for the really fucking depressing questions. Uh, do you think we should embrace collapse as something positive, natural, and progressive, as opposed to something scary? This... Uh, you can... Uh, you can frame it as uh, the death of a society. So if you can come to terms with your own death, then it's a similar, let's say, thought process when it comes to societies. It, mm -hmm. But you have to add additional aspects to it. For you, you get a bit philosophical, it's inevitable in this, in this regard. Uh, but human life tends to make sense the moment you can make something that lost, lasts just as long as you did. So if you have kids and they live just as long as you did, Mm -hmm. Or even if you have grandkids and then they live beyond your li lifespan just as much. Or you publish a book and you have the authorship, like, you know, the co copyright for another mm. uh, life, basically lifetime of yours. Or a company or something like this. This is, this is a, a sort of a rule of thumb of what we consider to be a success uh, meaningfully, even on a biological level, right? Mm. Nature wants us to have kids and grandkids eventually. Mm. And uh, the moment you have something surviving you, roughly the same amount of time that you lived, 
then this is a thumbs up. This is uh, basically as good as it gets in terms of, of potential success. With the collapse of the society, this is no longer an option. <laughs> Uh, you gotta be happy just with your own time, time, time uh, uh, lifetime, uh, because there's no guarantee of anything else beyond that surviving, and this is the um, the adjustment that needs to be made psychologically. It's a risky you, investment from then on. Yes, it's a very risky inv- investment, and mo- most of them will not pay off hmm. in some way or another. Either companies will fail, or kids will die, or something bad will happen. Jesus. Or, yeah. Positive notes. Jesus. So um, this is uh, um, this is very much down to the individual person, and their philosophy, and how they see the world. The way you come to, to to terms with your own death, which you typically don't do for a while, this is the way you do it for society. Mm-hmm. It's just that the time scale is pretty far off in the in the future, so it's not sort of immediate or impending, but. It's more of a thought uh, experiment. So basically, the the best way to hedge your bets is to have hundreds of children. Yes, like this uh, Genghis yes. Khan type. Of. This would be the maximally rational and maximally psychopathic. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> approach because Thank you, you would not really you. care Genghis about Khan, as you said. Yeah, you wouldn't really care about the well-being of the children or anything. Or but this would ensure you maximum evolutionary success. And you can also fight off any neighboring. And write a lot of books and make your children write your books. <laughs> yes, 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 and have them make uh, in, in companies or something and like maximum nepotism and things like this. Excellent. So excellent. Uh, basically all the worst of human nature like if you can do that then it has the big, biggest chances of surviving yeah excellent i think yeah. i think this is a good um, a good recommendation for anybody that's into can, books can, and can i follow up on this question to him unfortunately yes go can you <laughs> do you think that in a in a kind of a collapse scenario is going to be a because the question was can we embrace it what do you think about those movie scenarios where people kind of celebrate it as you know i mean Society is ending, whatever, asteroid is hitting, let's just go out, get drunk and do everything we wanted to do. Society what, what, what do you think about this? Is there such an effect in humans or is depression going to be dominant? It's probably more of a psychological thing than societal thing, but what's, what's your catch on this? If there's something outside of our control that will just kill us, then you can celebrate. <laughs> you can relax, everything can be like, you can embrace it. So this, uh, why, this is why I find most of your scenarios like, hallelujah, <laughs> like they're yeah. just, just great, <laughs> like really relieving. And uh, and the way the the collapse unfolds is uh, basically all cooperative endeavors at all levels fail. So every imaginable possible strategy, every sort of sign of goodwill that you might have in trying to make things work, they're completely and utterly exhausted Hmm. and abused and traumatized to the highest level. So it basically degrades the human spirit to the maximum extent until it all fails. So it's as dark and gritty and unpleasant as it can possibly ever be. And it's going to be slow. And, and, and over centuries, even maybe decades, okay. centuries. Yeah. So it'll be slow and grueling and painful and torturous and they're just the worst. So nobody would be, you know, uh, just in line for an orgy. That's what um, you're saying. No, they will be just out of sheer desperation. I, I don't ah, know about fun. you know if you know the underground scene in Germany or something, but yeah. <laughs> <Jeez>. <laughs> yeah. Uh, by the way, how is the experiment with the mice called? The universe twenty five. Universe twenty five. Yeah. So there are a few. Sounds like a movie, experiment. by the way. That's, uh... Uh, yeah. Okay, Victor. Time to uh, inject some uh, again optimism. Optimism. With our current technology, how far from Earth are we able to travel and survive? For how long is establishing a colony on Mars truly possible? Right now, with our current technology today, uh, let's say it like this. Financially viable, we're basically limited to here, potentially to the moon in the next decade or so. If we're talking about what's physically possible, I mean, what the hell, we can build a ship to go to a nearby star destroying the Earth in the process. Mm. Probably we could. Technologically feasible, but I mean... Would we collapse society for that to send a few people? Most likely not. Um, realistically, right now, the biggest issues with traveling uh, to Mars are basically that we've kind of reached this limit of, of, of speed of energy that we can get. I mean, the density of energy. It doesn't work by just building bigger rockets. I mean, you can build... It's logarithmic. The more you build in terms of a rocket, the more you need to start with to get to, to space. So it becomes this kind of feedback process similar to what 
you were describing in a way where um, I mean to get to a rocket which can get you to a nearby star you basically need to use all of Earth to build this rocket mm. so it, it should be this this big uh, in, a, in essence uh, to, to do it in a human lifetime with chemical fuel and the way to the only way to battle this is to increase efficiency so mm. for less fuel to get more energy and because right now we're still on chemical and chemical is pretty bad if we go to nuclear we're gonna jump this literally uh, a few orders of magnitude so hmm. at, at, if we go to nuclear in an effective way and we can unlock kind of the efficiency and the density of energy of nuclear fuel we're gonna go probably beyond mars with no issue but then to go even beyond this um right now we we need really a new technology because even on the nuclear fusion scale to get to the nearby stars is humanly impractical. I mean, so traveling should... in a human lifetime or in a few human lifetimes is, is just kind of not worth it. So, I mean, what you're saying is the issue is only propulsion. Well, not only propulsion. It's, it's propulsion if we want to get there in a sustainable way. Because mm. you're asking about a technology. I mean, if we can ship enough stuff from Earth to Mars, mm. we can make a colony. Mm. But shipping it in an economically viable way so that, you know, the cost of shipping living quarters for 20 people that are sustainable on Mars doesn't cost a country on Earth. I mean, this is the kind of trade-off that you need to do. The good thing, actually, is that I think these problems... Many people, they say, why the hell do you invest billions in space? I think these are some of the things which... And it touches something that you were mentioning again. Um, the more hostile the environment is, the more effective we become and the better we become. So, actually, a lot of the technology that actually helped us in the last 20, 30 years was induced by things like the Apollo program. I mean, the Apollo program is one of the single programs, the, moon, the, pro, the program that landed people on the moon. It was one of the single programs which resulted in about, it's something like 60 million patents and technology growths, which then spread around all industries. And basically, without that program, probably this, this curve... Maybe for good, but it wouldn't have gone so <laughs> steep uh, in the in the 60s and 70s. And the point is that the more hostile stuff is, the more we try to limit ourselves. If we learn to live on Mars, chances are we would have developed good enough technology that we could sustainably live on Earth. The mm. problem is, I mean, are we going to be content with it? Because most likely it would mean living a harder life for individual people, which is more sustainable, but I mean... Are we ready for it? So basically, there's going to be a kind of pressure that would allow us to reach greater complexity in technology, which yeah. would then be applicable to a more simple system, Yeah, basically. But, but, but then this, this also unlocks the next question. If we conquer Mars and the rest of the planets and so on and so on, aren't we just going to scale this to the, yeah. to the solar system instead of the Earth? I have one idea that came to mind just now, actually. Um, uh, it sort of it was it's in, it was in it was dormant in my mind in various forms. But what do you really want to preserve? Hmm. Do we want our bodies? Do we want our minds? What exactly do we want to leave? Because eventually hmm. any given human will die, right? Hmm. And uh, what 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 do we want to salvage? What what, what do we want to see flourish? Hmm. And my, my 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 guess would be some sort of sentience. So if uh, we could have some sort of AI, <laughs> that would be our children of mm. sorts, uh, or maybe transfer our minds to some silicon-based uh, yeah, um, Even more skeptical, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm just throwing ideas out yeah. there. Then, um, and uh, this can conceivably survive just as much as the human species, mm. like maybe hundreds of thousands of years, which would be a thumbs up in terms of evolutionary timescales. Uh, mm. And... Um, uh, yeah, in that case, you don't really need the huge spaceships. You can just have AI on a satellite that, or Voyager or something that was already quite far. And uh, it'll be much more, it'll cope with boredom much better than we do. Uh, depends if it's something We were like, not sure about this one, actually, about the boredom. This is the point. I mean. uh, yeah, well, you can just <laughs> turn off, like, for a while, and then you just... Uh, if, if you can, this is the point. I mean, yeah. can you make it complex enough so it's sentient and still maintain this ability? To, to do this. I mean, this is this is kind of the, the question because complexity, the way that you're introducing it, and I agree on this, uh, also in terms of what you call stations, for me, is it's more or less complexity yeah. in, in some shape and with some control context. So, yeah, I mean, uh, I agree on this, but this, this for me is still going to... Eventually, whatever we do, you see, even this ideal case where we become immortal spaceships that roam space, we're still going to get to the this other entropy that I spoke about. So I would Sorry. like to be an immortal spaceship. Yeah. I mean, I don't know about you guys. Well, but it sounds cool. It sounds cool, yeah. yeah. 
There's one question that's kind of related to uh, what you were talking about with the mice, in a way. It's, uh, would overstimulation kill evolution? Uh, so, the way I interpret this question, I mean, whoever asked it could correct me as well, but basically, uh, if you have abundant resources, would this negate um, both that uh, hierarchies that are being formed as with the mice and e- eventual development? I mean, let's say tomorrow we indeed create the uh, nuclear uh, fusion, we will have abundant resources because energy, you know, we can do a bunch of shit, we wouldn't be able to right now. Would this lead us into a slump technologically? So nuclear fusion, it wouldn't be um, a magical uh, solution because it involves very high levels of societal complexity to be maintained. And... um, what you actually want from your energy resource is a very high return on investment. Hmm. So for f- fossil fuels and oil specifically, um, with the hillbilly example, you could spend one barrel of oil, like r- riding around a donkey or a car or whatever, and you find 100 barrels. And this would be a return of 100 to 1, which is like unheard of in economic terms. But this is what we what was the case at the beginning of the century. And uh, this allowed uh, basically the oil industry to use m- maybe 1% of the energy itself, because this is what you needed to discover more. And this allowed all that excess energy to be used for everything else. And uh, the thing is, this has been decreasing exponentially over the last decade. So in the 70s, it was around 30 to 1, and now it's around 10 to 1, maybe 6 to 1. It varies. With the tar sands in Canada, it's 3 to 1, because you need to actually boil the sand to get the oil out. And the, the problem here is, uh, think about any species. About what, what's the minimum energy return on investment it needs to maintain a stable population? So for a hunter-gatherer society, you'd have the man bringing, out, bringing the most caloric input to the family. And if you have, if you have three family members, you need energy return of three to one hmm. to just maintain the most basic thing. And four to one if you, need to, if you want a stable population. Because, you know, two, two, two children per, per family. Hmm. And... Uh, that's like the most basic, basic of, of, of requirements for any species, like four to one energy return on investment in terms of, uh, of the amount of food you get. If you want people that don't work in getting, in getting energy, like uh, doctors or lawyers or well, who needs lawyers, but who uh, <laughs> <laughs> or wants lawyers, but uh, education or uh, any other endeavor or artists that don't necessarily use the, uh, the directly uh, procure energy, you need much higher levels of return on investment. And agriculture has provided this um, generally for human society, that it's high enough that some people don't need to bother with working the fields. Um, and uh, the problem is, uh, yeah, the, the thing with fusion and a lot of these uh, technologies that have, we haven't f- uh, discovered yet, they might require very high uh, investments to actually be maintained. Hmm. Fusion currently uses more energy than it produces. And if, if you need, uh, uh, and even if it give, gives us a positive return, it has to be huge hmm. to, man- to be able to maintain our comfort levels. Otherwise, um, the, the energy s- uh, sector tends to cannibalize everything else in society. So you wouldn't have arts, you wouldn't have really much education, just what's hmm. strictly necessary to maintain the the energy consuming uh, energy just technologists work. that maintain the reactors yeah just stem st- stem uh, fields basically yeah uh, well, yeah yeah more or less yeah. yeah japan has already eliminated most humanities from the curriculum <laughs> it's a stem apocalypse yeah stem apocalypse of sorts yeah stem apocalypse stem apocalypse something like this this is this is literally the worst pun no. <laughs> and uh, yeah the the thing is yeah this 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 uh, issue you need to cope with and um, uh, maybe uh, the intuition behind fusion that people think is like magic, like you, you get it mm. and then everything is like heaven. Uh, what would work was maybe just having I know aliens come over, uh, re- remove more, most of the CO two so we don't have global warming. Scoop and give, it up. Yeah, 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 and then give us a, a shitload of uh, free energy, like I don't know some crystals or more oil or something. Just dump it on on us and then they leave. And, yeah. and in that case, we would just throw most of our technology out, like just like fuck that, 
and we go back to Chevrolets from the 1950s or something, and we just keep on going like in happy, like hillbilly fashion. Because yeah. we don't give Towards a fuck. Towards the sunset. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because we wouldn't care, and things would be simple. And there are actually experiments with bacteria that they develop much more complex uh, biochemical uh, processing when there's scarce resources. When you give them much more sugar, they yeah. throw all that shit out <laughs> and just they, they just enjoy the benefits. The the nice because uh, like, evolutionary makes much more sense. Why keep all this complex machinery when you just want to have fun? Yeah. So put um, some sugar on me. Yeah. Yeah. So this is really what we want. We want heaven with no cost. So and uh, there's nothing really. It's not really on the table in terms of what's available on planet Earth. We've really yeah. eaten eat, eat them up all those cookies early on. Yeah. So yeah. So that's the the, the choices that uh, we potentially have: a stem apocalypse, or just sugar all the way down. Yeah. Yeah. Sugar all the way down. Yeah. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I guess that's that's what we learned from today. It's always gonna be shit unless aliens come and save us. So. <laughs>